Good evening and welcome to Assumption University. My name is John Capucci and I'm the Principal and Vice Chancellor here at Assumption. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that Assumption University resides on the traditional lands of the Three Fires Confederacy, comprised of the Odawa, the Ojibwa, and the Potawatomi. We also acknowledge the Huron's gift of land. Given that many guests are joining us from various areas, we encourage you to honor the land in which you are living and working. Tracing its origins to 1857, Assumption University is one of the most historic Roman Catholic institutes of higher learning in Canada. Informed by the Basilian tradition, we seek to empower individuals to cultivate goodness in themselves and others, embody discipline in their path toward excellence, and recognize the importance of constantly pursuing knowledge throughout their lives. This evening, we join as a community to recognize the Honorable Frank Iacobucci, retired justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. We will begin the, this evening with the conferral of the honorary degree by Bishop Ronald Peter Fabro, Bishop of London and Chancellor of Assumption. Following the degree conferral, his honor will present a lecture on that note, individuals who are interested in asking questions are welcome to do so in the chat feature, and we will endeavor to pose the questions to his honor uh, towards the end of the evening. At this time, I'd like to call upon our Chancellor, Bishop Fabro, to formally open a special convocation. Thank you, John. In the name of Assumption University, and in my role as chancellor, I hereby open convocation. My most reverend chancellor, it is my privilege and honor to present to you the honorable Frank Iacobucci. Frank Iacobucci has had a distinguished career in private practice, academia, government, and the judiciary. As the son of Italian immigrants, he was born, raised, and educated in Vancouver, British Columbia, where he received his Bachelor of Commerce degree and law degree from the University of British Columbia. He went on to receive his Master's of Laws and Diploma in International Law from Cambridge University in the UK. He began his career in 1964 as a lawyer at a large New York law firm where he practiced corporate and securities law. In 1967, he joined the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto and was a professor of law there until 1985. During his academic career, Frank was also a commissioner of the Ontario Securities Commission from 1982 to 1985 and counsel to the Etsy's Commission in 1974. He also served as Vice President Internal Affairs at the University of Toronto from 1975 to 1979 and was the Dean of the Faculty of Law from 1979 to 1983. From 1983 to 1985, he was Vice President and Provost of the University. In 1985, Mr. Iacobucci was appointed Deputy Minister of Justice and Deputy Attorney General for Canada. In 1988, he was appointed as Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Canada. And in 1991, he became a Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. The Honorable Frank Iacobucci retired from the Supreme Court of Canada in June of 2004 and served as interim president of the University of Toronto from September 2004 until June of 2005. He was appointed as the federal representative to negotiate the settlement of the residential schools litigation, which was the largest settlement in Canadian history. On July 1, 2005, he joined Tories LLP as counsel and served on numerous boards, including Tim Hortons, Torstar Corp, and the advisory board for General Motors of Canada. In 2008, he reported on the inquiry he conducted regarding the mistreatment of three alleged terrorists. In, 2000, in, in February of 2013, he submitted his report as an independent review for the Ontario government on the lack of First Nations representation on Ontario juries. He also acted in numerous matters involving Indigenous peoples, communities across Canada for the federal and provincial governments as both a mediator and facilitator. He has also advised municipal governments and agencies, including completing a comprehensive report for the Toronto Police Services relating to police encounters 
with people in crisis. In 2018, he was appointed by the Government of Canada to oversee the consultation and accommodation discussions with Indigenous communities regarding the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Mr. Yakabuchi has received numerous honours and awards and recognition in Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom and Italy. In 1993, he received the Commendatore dell'Ordine al Merito della Repubblica Italiana, or the Commander of the, Order of, the Merit, the Ita uh, Order of Merit for the Italian Republic. And he was appointed a Companion in the Order of Canada in July of 2007. In addition to authoring and co-authoring judgments of the Supreme Court of Canada and the Federal Court of Canada, he has written or co-written numerous books, articles, and commentaries on a wide variety of legal and other subjects. My most reverend chancellor, as principal and vice chancellor, and on behalf of the Board of Governors of Assumption University, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, on the Honorable Frank Yakabuchi. In the name of Assumption University, and by the powers invested in me as chancellor, I hereby I confer on you doctor. the Honorable Frank Yakabuchi, the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa with all the rights, privileges and honors therein. Please join me in congratulating the Honorable Dr. Yakabuchi. I now formally close convocation and invite the Honorable Dr. Yakabuchi to address us this evening with a special presentation entitled, The Law and My Life. <clears throat> Most Reverend Chancellor, Bishop Fabro and friends, thank you, Principal Capucci, for your kind and kind words and hospitality. Thank you, Most Reverend Chancellor and the Board of Governors for conferring on me the Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. I am greatly moved by receiving the honorary degree for many reasons. As Principal Capucci mentioned, Assumption University's founding is older than Canada. Canada's beginning as a country. And an honorary degree from Assumption permits me to be connected with pre-Confederation and pre-Confederation institution. But beyond the historical connection, my degree connects me with the impressive alumni of the university, its many accomplishments, and its future role as an important post-secondary institution in our country. For all this and more, I'm profoundly grateful. Now, in speaking with Principal Capucci, he suggested I speak this evening on reflections looking back over my career during the last 60 years. It is one topic that I know a fair amount about. In fact, I might be an expert on the subject. Although by definition, it's entirely subjective and biased, but I hope it will be of some interest because of the transformative period of the years I have witnessed. I've entitled uh, the talk that the law in my life, not the usual my life in the law, simply because my life has consisted of many more things than the law. At the outset, I can say that this is the first address I've ever given that is without footnotes and is secure from allegations of plagiarism. But dear friends, please forgive me for what is 
overly egocentric and an overdosing of name dropping. As <clears throat> the principal mentioned, my parents were Italian immigrants. My father was the only son and youngest of seven children and had no formal education at all. My mother had grade five, but both she and my father were highly intelligent. At 19 years of age, my father came to Vancouver in 1922, estranged from his parents because he was disinherited of the tenant interest in the farm in favor of an adopted son who was younger than he. That's a long story in itself. My father chose Vancouver because his older sister and her husband went there before World War I in the period of huge immigration to Canada. In 1925, my mother was brought to Vancouver by two paternal uncles who were comfortably established in Vancouver, although one of them had a questionable, if not mysterious, past. My father, my mother left her parents in Italy when she was only 16 years old and was part of an arranged marriage. This was fairly common in those days. And let me explain. My mother had six sisters and one brother. There was a tradition of dowry. And since her parents could not afford to pay a dowry for all the girls, they saw a solution in my mother going to Canada to be married. She remained very close to her parents, even though she never saw them again. I never knew all this until years after my mother had died. And it was my older sister who told the story to me. I believe my mother felt somewhat ashamed of this and did not want me or my brothers to know, especially since she refused to marry the man. The uncle chose for her because he was more than double her age. I wish my mother had told me this, as I would have said how proud I was of her courage at such a young age to stand up for herself. My father was a boarder at the home of one of the uncles, which is how he met my mother. They were married in 1929, which of course was not great timing, especially since the earlier 20s were generally good years for immigrants from Europe. With an older brother and sister, I was the third child and was followed, followed by a younger brother. Unfortunately, I'm, only, I'm the only survivor of my siblings. We lived mostly in the east end of Vancouver with a brief move to the west end in uh, the district of Kitsilino. People often said to us, we lived on the wrong side of the tracks as opposed to the rest, rest end, which was the so-called right side. I've always rejected that categorization. And I called the East End, of course, the poor side of the tracks, because that's what it was. But it wasn't wrong. But nonetheless, that area was a in very interesting environment. My parents, rented a, a house on a street called McSpadden, a very small street that runs into a major street called Commercial Drive. On that street lived the Essen family who were Scottish and owned a bakery on Commercial Drive and whose son Bill became Chief Justice of the BC Supreme Court. Also close by to my parents' rented house were the Barrett family who were Jewish and had a truck, vegetable and fruit business 
and whose son Dave later became premier of British Columbia. Finally, there was my family and my older brother, Danny, who was a classmate of Bill Essen and Dave Barrett at high school. Apparently my con contribution to McSpadden Street, the Matt McSpadden Street families was that according to my older siblings, I was conceived on that street. Not much of a contribution. To illustrate something of the life in those days in the 1930s and 40s, I want to mention two matters, one humorous and the other not so funny. During the depression years, it was obviously tough for families to survive. To make ends meet, my parents had vegetable gardens and fruit trees in the backyard of their house, then on a purchased home on Fifth Avenue, again near Commercial Drive. But in that backyard, they had rabbits, chickens, goats, which I'm sure violated the city bylaws. In the front yard, my mother had a lovely display of flowers and shrubs, which she learned to color, cultivate from Mrs. Brown, who lived across the street and had a beautiful English rose garden. Well, one day our nanny goat got loose and wandered over to the Brown's Rose Garden and practically demolished it. As many domestic animals, especially goats, don't know when to stop eating. Now, despite a good friendship with my mother, this was too much for Mrs. Brown to take she, and she called the police. In those days, many of the police were of Scottish heritage and two tall, burly detectives came to my home, our home. After knocking on the door, my mother, who was about four feet 10 or 11, answered looking up to those, to those giants. One de de detective in a Scottish burr asked if she had a goat. My mother said, yes. The cop then asked, did your goat get loose and go over to Mrs. Brown's garden? Again, my mother replied, yes. And then the de detective asked, and did your goat eat up virtually the entire rose garden? And consistently, my mother replied, yes. At which the, cap, the cop finally asked, madam, what's your name? And my mother, instantly imagining headlines in the newspaper, Rosita Yakabuchi was arrested by police, said in a very thick Italian accent, uh, a Mrs. Mackenzie. The cops collapsed with laughter and left. The not funny example involved World War II in Italy being Canada's enemy. My parents were enemy aliens, a status <clears throat> that had serious consequences. My father lost his job, his labor job at the Vancouver airport with the foreman in tears while telling him he was to be fired. My parents had to check in monthly with the RCMP. <clears throat> I practiced my father stopped because he didn't think it was necessary after a few visits. My mother felt otherwise, and I can remember accompanying her to the RCMP station on many occasions. Another consequence was that our parents encouraged us to speak English, not Italian, because we would be better integrated into Canadian society and would not stand out otherwise or otherwise attract negative attention by speaking Italian. The result is that my Italian linguistic capacity is not what it otherwise might have been. Having said that our family didn't suffer too much compared to other Italian families who had fathers or relatives interned like the Japanese Canadian and one of those Italian Canadians was the father-in-law of my older brother. There weren't that many interned, not like the 20,000 Japanese Canadians who were interned. But my parents never held any of this against Canada, nor 
I might add, did the most of the others, internees who, uh, from Vancouver. My parents liked to have a royal calendar, king and queen, in our kitchen, and we're always grateful to be in Canada. Now, I've dwelt on my family because my parents and siblings were fundamentally important in my life in so many ways. The values transmitted to me by my parents, which include, included getting an education because no one can take it away from you, working as hard as you can, as shown by both of them, and not bringing shame to the family. Noting it wasn't expressed as bringing honor to the family, as that was too high a standard. Whereas not bringing shame was certainly attainable by all of us. All of these and other values shaped me not only as a lawyer and a judge, but also as a father and now grandfather, and most importantly, as a human being. With this background, my older brother used to spend time with me on educational subjects, which I took to like a sponge. He taught me to play cribbage before I went to school, as well as more academic subjects such as parts of speech and grammar and arithmetic, well before I encountered the subjects in school. This resulted in my being a good student. At the same time, I loved sports. School and sports kept me on the straight and narrow, despite some fellow students who strayed off course with the, without those interests and got into serious trouble, including doing jail time. I don't know why, but around grade three, I thought I'd be a doctor. Apparently I said to my parents, I wanted to work with my head, not my body, the way my father did. Let me be, but, but let me be clear, I greatly admired the work ethic of my father. He was a steel foundry worker and through him I got a summer job doing shift work at the foundry, working most of the time under his very tough supervision. However, the medical career aspiration disappeared because I became a, something of a wimp at the sight of blood. Something else happened to foreclose the medical avenue while I was at elementary school, which I uh, attended after our family returned to the East End after our brief sojourn in Quetzalcoatl. At that elementary school, there was a little ceremony for the grade six students who were moving on to junior high school grades six, uh, seven, eight, and nine. In that little ceremony, the principal gave a few remarks about each of us graduating. About me, he said I was a great talker and could be the next Angelo Branca. I had no idea what the principal was talking or who the principal was talking about. If anything, I thought he was a football player for Notre Dame. Anyway, when I went home, I asked my father about this man Branca and my father who knew him said he was a very good criminal lawyer and a leader of the Italian Canadian community in Vancouver who later, become, who later became a judge of the BC Court of Appeal. But that was no doubt about it. What the principal said was the seed that planted law in my mind and became my professional target. I went on to junior high school and high school uh, in the East End playing sports and thoroughly enjoying school and getting great support from my teachers, even though I was sometimes mischievous. Mischievous. To confess, I got the strap on a couple of occasions for goofing off and I thoroughly deserved the punishment. But part of my goofing off was motivated motivated by my wanting to be accepted by my peers as a regular guy, not an apple polisher who was in, interested only in good grades. And that was another reason for my love of sports, especially soccer, basketball, and baseball. In that connection, soccer was my top sport and I was called up to, 
to the top league in BC, probably the top league in Canada at that time, the Pacific Coast Soccer League. That was semi-pro. I was called up at 17, which was not by itself unusual, but in my case, it was special because one of the papers described me as, and I quote, believed to be the first Japanese Canadian to play in the Pacific Coast Soccer League. The Japanese name confusion has accompanied me in all my life. Yakabuchi sounds like Yamaguchi and therefore could be Japanese. So since grade six, there was never much doubt about my resolve to go to UBC and eventually law school. As was mentioned, I did commerce as an undergraduate and I have to confess that I did not enjoy that uh, subject. But one of our mandatory courses was economic statistics, which to, to the commerce students was a tough course. Uh, in the Christmas exam, I barely passed, but in the final exa exam, I think I wrote the best exam I had ever written and, ever, and since. As a result, I was asked by my professor, a man called Tadek Matichewski, to be a lab assistant in the course, which I did for three years and it paid well and enabled me to buy a car. This is all relevant because one day Matichewski asked me what I was going to do with my life. I told him I wished to go to law school. He said that was a mistake. I asked why and he replied, I didn't have the right name. I was shocked. I knew I had a funny name, but I wonder what was behind Matichewski's comment. He said, we should go talk to John Deutsch. He was then the chairman of the political economy department at UBC, later to become principal of Queen's University. In our meeting, Deutsch said Canada was changing. And if I wanted to pursue law studies, I should. But I still found the, 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 his remark disquieting. Canada was changing. What did that mean? Why should anyone's name get in the way of one's career aspiration? Later, I was to discover there was substance behind the sentiments of both Matichewski and Deutsch. The legal profession then was not an open one. As I soon found out, not only in Canada, but also in the United Kingdom and in the United States. Anyway, I entered law school in 1959 as part of the class of 1962 to graduate later. And I say that the 62 classmates were the best anyone could wish for, talented, diverse, great fun. And fun has been a constant companion in my life. And most of my law classmates shared that out to me. I had lots of stories to talk about that, but I will just simply say, I've done teaching at the University of Toronto, Cambridge, Yale, other Canadian law schools. I would not trade the class of 62 for any other class. The UBC faculty were a good group and many encouraged me to think of graduate studies in law and, very, and were very supportive in that regard. Then I come to a very most transformative experience in my life. Despite my numerous efforts at being a class clown, I did well at the law school. Having been to Europe in the summer between second and third years, I wanted to see more of the world. So I applied for fellowships for graduate studies. I was disqualified because of age for the Rhodes Scholarship. I was especially disappointed about that because I was told of the disqualification just before we were to have the interviews with the uh, selection committee. However, I got a fellowship to study international law and I chose Cambridge mainly because it arguably had the strongest collection of international law professors. I chose Cambridge and St. John's College, one of the, the second largest college of Cambridge. I was greatly supported by prof two professors at UBC, both of whom were graduates of Cambridge and indeed of St. John's. I fast forward many decades, I I'm able to say today, I cherish that I'm an honorary fellow of St. John's College, which I consider a, 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 a very special and distinguished recognition. I, I'm not sure I deserve it. 
I think my professors who supported me would be rather incredulous to know that, but I think they would be dis they would be very pleased. But the study of international law with the intellectual experience of Cambridge, as good as it was, pales in comparison in comparison to the most transformative and significant development in my personal and professional life, meeting Nancy. Far more accomplished and modest than anyone I have ever met. Her entering my life made my failure to get a Rhodes Scholarship, which is tenable at Oxford, the best thing that ever happened to me. She was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Mount Holyoke College and a magna cum laude graduate of the Harvard Law School, where she was one of the small handful of women at the time in the law school and even a smaller group as an editor of the Harvard Law Review. I make no apologies for bragging about her. Nancy was simply put a pioneer for women in the law. Everything I have done takes a back seat to the support, guidance and love that she has given to me. After 57 years of marriages, three children and seven grandchildren. It is my spouse, it is my spouse and offspring that dominate my universe, not the law. Now, Nancy never wrote anything I had to write as an academic, but she was an, a gifted editor of virtually everything I wrote. She also never wrote any opinions I did as a lawyer, but she would have proved, she would have improved on them, I'm sure. And the same could have been said about my work as a judge. She, she was quick to criticize some of my work as a judge, but I'm, I was grateful then that she didn't edit my judgments. She made the adjustment to the United Kingdom for me palatable because things in 1962 when we went were not that comfortable for students. There was no central heating. My room, my bedroom it was freezing cold no heat. And my first year landlady, who affectionately called me because she couldn't pronounce my name, she called me Mr. Wybocki, used to put a stone hot water bottle in my bed during the winter of 62, 63, when the Cam River that flows through Cambridge, it, that river froze. And the tank of, of water above the toilet, of the toilet in our home, that the home I was staying in, was uh, frozen solid. The no local newspaper called the winter the coldest since Cromwell. For well, my second year, I was for fortunate to be asked to be a tutor in international law for St. John's College, which paid a handsome amount to help me live a little more comfortably and for which I shall never forget the kindness and generosity of St. John's. I should also mention that at Cambridge where there were two outstanding Canadians, Ian Binney, later whom I got to know as a colleague and, then, and a friend at both the Justice Department and at the Supreme Court of Canada, and David Johnston, a, a colleague at, at the UT Faculty of Law and, and of course, a, 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 a wonderfully successful Governor General of our country. I never met them at Cambridge, uh, but we became colleagues and good friends later in Canada. On my arrival in Cambridge, I saw a world that was compared to my East End roots, unimaginable. The beauty of the university, the history, the world crossroads of people were breathtaking, including the talents of the students and their mastery of the language. I, I, as I told our son Edward, who after studying at Queens went to Oxford, I told him to remember Edward, it's their language, and we Canadians just rent it. At the same time, Oxford and Cambridge are communities of, of academic eccentrics. Let me illustrate. On my way to Cambridge, I went to Oxford uh, first before going to Cambridge with a couple of good friends uh, from UBC who were world scholars. We went to uh, one of them, the uh, college, which was Maudlin, which was a beautiful Oxford college, 
And we, I wanted to go up, to, they wanted me to go up to the tower there, but to see the view, which was really quite something. But to mount the tower, you had to get the permission of a fellow of the college. So uh, we all went to ask Professor Gilbert Weil, who was at that time, one of the world's eminent philosophers. Ryle asked me as the guest what I was doing in the UK. And I told him I was on my way to Cambridge. And he asked which college. And I told him St. John's. And he exclaimed puffing madly on his pipe, excellent choice. I was pleased to hear his reaction and asked why he thought that, he thought that uh, was the case with St. John's. And he replied, best lavatories in Cambridge. Now, I, I, I just almost fainted. I didn't think this eminent philosopher would have come up with that as the way of distinguishing the excellence of St. John's College. And speaking of lavatories, it reminds me of my first visit to the Cambridge Law School's laboratory. The graffiti on the walls was really quite witty and clever. One of my favorites was, to do is to be Adam Smith. To be is to do Jean-Paul Sartre. Dooby dooby doo, Frank Sinatra. That's a higher grade graffiti that I was used to. At Cambridge, Nancy and I became close friends and still are with Lawrence Collins, now Lord Collins of Maysbury. He was the first English solicitor to be a QC, a Queen's Counsel. The first solicitor to go to the High Court of Chancery the English Court of Appeal, the House of Lords, and the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. Well known as the editor of a ma major work on the conflict of laws, he, as a student, introduced me to two of his college buddies. One was John Cleese of Monty Python and Faulty Towers, whom I met, who was just, uh, and met him on his turn uh, when he came to Toronto. Uh, and Jonathan Lynn, he was the creator of the Yes Minister series on BBC television, which was just very, just outstanding television. And he was the superb director of one of my favorite movies, My Cousin Vinny. Uh, he was an Englishman, the director of that movie, which is, if you've seen it, see it, and it takes place in the South. So we had a great time at Cambridge and having decided to get married, we faced the challenge of getting a job in the same country, in the same city. Nancy had an offer to go to a, a large prestigious Washington firm, Covington Burling. I should mention that although women were not much evident in law firms, Ropes Gray uh, was an impressive Boston firm where her father and brother went after law school. They were both graduates of Harvard. They, they offered her a job at $6,500 a year and this was apparently $700 less than the men were, gonna, were getting. And Nancy asked why there was that difference. She was told the firm didn't expect her to work long hours. She refused the, the offer. And years later, she found out that the firm quickly changed the policy after their uh, refusal, after her refusal. I applied to many law firms, Boston, New York, and Washington, and struck out. However, I did get an offer from one Boston firm that was just new, uh, now the, one of the famous ones, but on condition, Nancy came. So they were ready to take me for, as, a, as, a, as a throwaway as long as she came. But eventually I did land a, 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 a job in a New York a, a law firm, Dury, Ballantyne, Bushby, Palmer and Wood, then the second largest firm in the city and that was headed by the former governor of New York and presidential hopeful Thomas Dewey. Nancy was at a, another firm, but in second year uh, of her work, uh, in the second year, she became pregnant uh, with our first child who was born in Brooklyn. For the next three years, I learned a lot about big Wall Street law firms, worked, uh, how they worked as teams and how sophisticated and hardworking they were. I also saw firsthand that women and ethnic minorities were not in the partnership, just as they were not in Toronto or Vancouver. 
at the time. In fact, there were Jewish firms, Irish firms, Asian and Italian heritage firms in those cities. All of that has drastically changed today. I have to say that coming from Rostock, you call it Cambridge with a Canadian legal background required a huge adjustment to go to a Wall Street law firm. I was very green to say the least. Although New York was exciting, with a family starting, both of us felt we did not want to raise our kids in the city. I'd always thought of an academic career, so I applied to, uh, to uh, Osgoode Hall and, and, and uh, Toronto, and I didn't get an offer from Osgoode, but I was pursued later by them. But I did get one from Toronto, thanks to a, a colleague who's very, been very close friend for uh, all of our professional life, Marty Friedland. In any event, I, I got the appointment at, at, uh, at the University of Toronto's law school, and that was the beginning of a beautiful relationship, which lasted almost 20 years and still continues to today. I taught various sort of subjects has been mentioned, uh, what I did in practice, corporate law, income tax, and so on. And I enjoyed the uh, experience immensely and quietly found that the best way to learn something is to teach it. Interestingly, after my first year in Toronto, I got a call from the partner for, for whom I worked at the Dewey Law Firm, was offered the general counsel job at a large oil company they acted for and for whom I had done a lot of work. At that time, the company was about to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the salary they were willing to give me was left blank. I could fill it in. Plus with stock options that caused millionaire stars to start shining in my eyes. However, it meant moving to San Antonio, Texas. Nancy said, no way, I agreed and I refused. And I have to say, I never had an offer anything like that again. So I went to the university and had this positions that the, that the principal mentioned in his citation. Uh, and like at every uh, kind of leadership position in any institution, no matter what it is, there are ups and downs. Uh, and there were uh, that uh, in my experience at the University of Toronto. Uh, there, but however, there is this academic freedom of a professor, which is like the independence of a judge. Both, the, 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 both those freedoms are necessary and extraordinarily precious. It, it, and it's not without responsibility that's connected uh, to the uh, main mission uh, of the university, which is the creation, enhancement, dissemination, and preservation of knowledge. In the law school, uh, context, however, it's also connected with the importance of being relevant to the legal profession and the judiciary to ensure that the public are well served and that the law should change and develop for the betterment of society. I was very comfortable in the university setting, but my situation there was to change dramatically because one day in the late, late summer of 1985, I got a message to call a Gordon Oswald Destin. And I thought I was calling the placement kicker for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, who has the similar surname. Well, that Oswald Destin was the clerk of the Privy Council, who was the head of the Federal Public Service in Ottawa. He said he was calling on behalf of the Prime Minister, then Brian Mulroney, to offer me the position of Deputy Minister of Justice and Deputy Attorney General of Canada. I was overwhelmed position was head of the largest law firm in Canada, then about 1,200 lawyers. I don't, don't know what it is today, but probably four times to five times that. Obviously, I discussed this with Nancy, who yet again was supportive, although it meant a move to Ottawa with some complications for her and our children. Uh, that uh, was a, ch a challenging move for all of us. Uh, I, I didn't have any, any French to speak of. I had no criminal law background. I knew no one in the senior positions of the public service. Um, 
I, and I had no public service experience. I have never worked harder or at a faster pace than the time I spent as deputy minister. I compared my job to a spider trying to spin a web in a toilet bowl. I had two great ministers, John Crosby and Raina Titian, and was very fortunate to have them, especially since they were not only intelligent, but they also loved to laugh. Again, I could provide a chapter on our, our relationships and what we did together. Both of them became close friends, kept in contact with them. Unfortunately, both are gone. I'll never forget my first meeting with John Crosby. He was a shy man on a one-to-one -one basis. He was not shy in a public setting. He started off by saying, now I want you to know, Mr. Deputy, I don't kiss anybody's arse, except from time to time, the prime ministers and James. This was his New, New, Newfoundland way of uh, bringing color. Uh, he was a brilliant man, uh, no question uh, of, of, of superior uh, intellect. Natitian also loved to laugh, and it was a tragedy that he died, died so young. I still keep in contact with his widow, who's a remarkable Canadian. It was a fascinating year. The, the files were challenging, Meech Lake, Aboriginal self-government, free trade, official languages, and, and so on. The follow-up of the Morgenthaler decision of the Supreme Court declaring the abortion section of the criminal code unconstitutional in other cases, the GSC and so on. The interface between the public service and, and the political masters was both exhilarating and challenging. The independence of public servants, like judges and professors in the academy or on the bench is crucial to our democracy. Speaking truth to power is a cliche, but it's so fundamentally important. I worry a lot today when there are signs that that objectivity and independence of the public services throughout our country could have been compromised in one or two or even more cases. That's a topic for another day. But then after three years, I got another surprising call this time from the prime minister. And this was the federal court. As is the practice, when I got the prime minister's office call, it was an alert from his receptionist scheduler to give me notice of an imminent call from the prime minister. Uh, that's to not waste the prime minister's time in getting someone not in. I prepared for the call by assembling some current files to anticipate reasons for his call. Well, no files were needed as he was calling me to offer me the position of Chief Justice of the Federal Court. I was greatly surprised because many months earlier, I had been requested by his office to recommend people for the job which I had done. I asked the Prime Minister if I could discuss my disappointment with Nancy. He said, sure, but call me back in the morning. I talked to Nancy, she liked Ottawa, and we both agreed it was a good thing to do, unexpected as it was. It was, also, it was good also because deputy minister's jobs are generally quite time sensitive. And I had been deputy for about three years, which was way longer than the average term of a deputy minister. Go from one deputy position, the law was my professional passion. And another principle which I believe and I have observed perhaps to a fault, is that it's better to leave a job too early rather than too late. Or put another way, leave when your colleagues are saying, don't leave. So I accepted. And yet again, this was a new challenge. I had not only to learn how to be a judge, but how to be a chief justice. My formula to meet this challenge is what I used in the Justice Department, candor. I told colleagues I needed their help and would do everything to get up to speed and work with them, rather than the other way around. The federal court has had special challenges through its history, tensions with the provincial superior courts <clears throat> and the appointment of ex-politicians or patronage appointments, a charge I suppose could have been leveled at me. The fact is that with federal appointments to the bench, one has to be known, not personally, socially or politically, but rather professionally, 
to the appointing authority who have to be known, whether it be the Minister of Justice or the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister appoints members of the Supreme Court and the Chief Justices of the provinces. The Minister of Justice theoretically appoints the others, but, uh, but the appointment process has become centralized. And I don't think many appointments get by without the Prime Minister knowing uh, who they are. I was fortunate to be welcomed by my court of, Federal Court of Appeal colleagues in the same way I was welcomed by Justice and the other public service leaders from whom I was keen to get their guidance and help. These Court of Appeal judges emphasized the importance of having important, of having intellectual professional qualifications for the role, along with other qualities, including working collegially, listening and keeping one's mind open and considering the role of the institution and not just one's role as a judge or one's legacy. Appellate judges are part of a team who are temporary occupants of, on the bench, but the, but the judges leave, but the bench remains, the institution endures. So that's the perspective on which to focus. That was my philosophy, which I took with me to the Supreme Court. And I must add how grateful I am to those on the Federal Court of Appeal for their, those judges for their help and guidance. I did feel my experience at the university in various leadership posts helped me immensely in being a deputy minister and chief justice, since although organizationally distinct and different, all three institutions involve human interaction, teamwork, and the importance of building a relationship with each other that enables the optimal attainment of the institution's mission. They also all prize the importance of independence and serving the public. Now, unlike the appointment to the Deputy Minister and Chief Justice, the appointment to the Supreme Court of Canada, although more daunting in many respects, came with more knowledge and less surprise that I don't mean to be immodest, but what I mean is there's always rumors there are always that there are, were always rumors about future appointments to the Supreme Court, and my name was mentioned in the private and public rumor mill. However, that mention is not tantamount to appointment, and is never a sure thing until you get the call from the Prime Minister. And when I got that call in December of 1990, the first thing I said to the Prime Minister, again Mulroney, was that I wished my mother were alive. She had died 10 years earlier. I later, later read in a, a book that Justice Frankfurt of the US Supreme Court made a similar statement to Franklin, Rose, uh, Franklin Roosevelt when he called to appoint Frankfurt to the US court. Needless to say, I was overjoyed and overwhelmed. Um, and uh, uh, the prime minister told me he was, uh, I was uh, succeeding Bertha Wilson, and he was saying, look, I'm, he will be saying I'm appointing the best person for the job, and added that I had the record to back up his opinion. Oddly enough, one of my colleagues on the Supreme Court, when I first went there, greeted my first visit with, I like you, Frank, but you should be a woman. To which I replied, I would do most things to serve my country, but a gender change was not one of them. There is no doubt that membership on the Supreme Court of Canada has been the pinnacle of my professional experience. I pinched myself virtually every other day I was on the court to realize the privilege and honor of being there. At my swearing in ceremony, I dedicated my appointment to the memory of my mother and to my father, who was then ill in Vancouver. All of my Nancy's siblings and partners came, and yes, Bill Essen, Dave Barrett, and my older brother Danny were there, those three from McSpadden Street. They had their reunion of sorts at, at, at my ceremony. And a most touching part of the ceremony was Chief Justice Lemaire speaking in Italian for the benefit of the video that was made principally for my father to view. The spoken of Italian of the chief was not just a few lines, but many paragraphs. I'm sure it was the first time Italian was uttered in the Supreme Court. But during the Chief Justice, Chief Justice's Italian remarks, I thought back 
to my meeting with professors Matichewski and Deutsch over 30 years previously and saying that I should not go into the law because I didn't have the right name. I, I confess I was never so nervous in my life as I was at the first conference I had of the, after, after the first case I heard as a judge of the Supreme Court. The court goes to conference to discuss the case and the decision. The tradition was for the Fredunia judge to give his or her views as the first speaker and then go to the senior judges. I was, as I said, I was very, very nervous as the lead off speaker. I kept thinking, what will my new colleagues think of my views? Will they ask themselves, what was the, who was, what has the prime minister given us, et cetera. Our Supreme Court compared to the US Supreme Court and I expect others operates more collegially. We, we there's a, a relatively, well, some years ago, a, a book appeared on the US Supreme Court called Scorpions which deals with the Roosevelt appointees to the court. There were four of them. The Scorpion's title apparently is traceable to the description of the US court given by the eminent constitutional scholar, the late Alexander Bickel of the Yale Law School, who pluked for Justice Frankfurter. When asked to describe the US Supreme Court, Bickel answered nine scorpions in a bottle. Now that might be a little harsh, I've met a number of them, they're amazingly talented people. Uh, and I, I think that was a little overdone perhaps. If we had to come up with an insect analogy for the Canadian Supreme Court, it might be nine busy bees in a hive. But our court is not as an individual judge oriented as it is, as is its US counterpart. Justice Powell of the US Supreme Court called it the last called his court the last citadel of individualism, operating as a great extent like nine individual law firms. But that's part of the stamp of American character, a great emphasis on the individual, not a lot of emphasis on government or the collectivity as much as there is in Canada. That doesn't say it's wrong, it just says it's different. And, and our uh, cooperation, cooperative collegiality was, was was quite different. We worked together to choose our law clubs. In the US, they make their independent choices uh, by themselves. Uh, but again, not to criticize, it's just that it's different. The menu of cases uh, continue to involve difficult issues at the court. Very few cases are straightforward and free of complexity. If they were easy, we wouldn't have granted permission to come to our, the court. Um, we have even decided a case with one counsel never showed up for the case uh, because the counsel who was there, we, we, we felt he, he, he should lose the case. And we decided that without the appellate's counsel present and yet he won the appeal. Service on the court allowed to, one to take stock of the courts of our country as well as the administration of justice nationwide. Uh, we could also form a, a, an opinion of the caliber of the bar on all accounts, on all accounts. And I've said this in many uh, remarks that I've delivered. I have a very high opinion our of our legal profession um, and our judiciary. Uh, no one is perfect, uh, uh, but the track record is most impressive and it is, even when it's more reinforced when one travels to other countries. I'm always glad to return to Canada because relatively speaking, we are so well off in many ways. And my gladness includes an appreciation for the judiciary legal profession, including the quality of legal education. Not to say we have serious challenges such as access to justice, but all that implies, no, no question about it is usually and there's obviously room for improvement in all sectors of the administration of justice. But we have much for which to be grateful. Judges in the Supreme Court have two major dimensions to their work. First, justice through law for the parties in the case before them. And second, to be the principal architects for the development of jurisprudence of our country. Law is dynamic and organic, but as one judge, one wise judge once said, 
Law must be stable, but it can't stand still. The court, in my view, coming from an early history that was somewhat undistinguished, has risen in stature to be one of the key high courts of the world. But that position cannot be attained without the foundation of solid appeal courts and trial courts on which to build. Nor can the Supreme Court's respected position be achieved without the quality of the advocates who appear before the court, as well as the successful record of our law schools and the research and teaching efforts of our law professors and students. It has been a superb privilege to serve in all segments of the legal system, practicing lawyer in the private and public sectors, law professor and scholar, I hope, judge, and now back to the private sector, a time off for other pursuits. Well, my story is ongoing and I thank God for that. Since retiring from the court, I've been delighted to serve the public good in a number of ways uh, which have been mentioned uh, by um, our, our principal this evening. Um, and I, I've had wonderful, I spent, I've come to specialize a lot in indigenous issues because I feel the indigenous people and, it, uh, and its relationship with Canada is to me the most important societal issue facing our country. To conclude these remarks, I couldn't have done these things without holding the positions I did before in previous positions. And I couldn't have gotten the positions that I have described without a number of factors. And let me list them. First is my family and the values I received from them. They shape one not only as a professional, but more importantly, as a human being. Second, the selection of my life partner, Nancy. <clears throat> Third, the mentorship and friendship of teachers, friends, and colleagues, and the importance of teamwork. Fourth, obtaining the qualifications and experience that permits one to gain what is necessary to move on to other challenging and exciting opportunities. Fifth, the incredible role that providence, providence, plays in one's personal and professional life compared to planning. Planning is important, but not as determinative as good fortune. Of that, I've had more than I deserve, as I hope I've demonstrated in these remarks. Finally, the gratitude I feel toward Canada. We should all do our best to make sure future generations can take advantage of what we all have been able to experience, both for individual fulfillment and for the benefit of society. In listening to me, I hope you've enjoyed just a small fraction of the enjoyment I have had in putting these remarks together. Thanks again for the honorary degree and may God bless you all. Thank you, Your Honor, for that wonderful lecture and talk and, and journey, I would say, through your life from uh, British Columbia all the way to the Supreme Court and beyond. And I, of course, I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the journey to Italy as well as sharing a common background. It was very touching. Um, again, congratulations on receiving an honorary Doctor of Laws from Assumption University. We're very proud to have you as our newest uh, alumnus and uh, welcome you to that, that uh, very large family. Um, at this point, we welcome any questions that people might have for his honor. We can take a few questions. Uh, if you'd like to write them in the chat feature on, um, on YouTube, you're more than welcome to do that. I'll give people a few minutes, but we actually already have some questions that have come in and uh, I'll ask them to his honor. And if, again, you have questions, feel free to write them into the, uh, the chat feature. So one of the questions we have, um, uh, your honor, is... Uh, what was the most decision you, the most difficult decision you had to make while serving on the Supreme Court? Well, for me, um, I mean, the, the, it's hard to pick out the, the, the one because the, the, there were a number. The most um, broadly based question was these secession reference a case 
that came to us from the federal government. The federal government can refer a, a, a question of law to the Supreme Court uh, under the uh, Supreme Court Act. Uh, and it referred uh, uh, questions uh, on the, um, uh, could Quebec, the province of Quebec, unilaterally secede uh, uh, under the Canadian constitution. Um, and, uh, and other incidental questions. You know, could it do so under international law? And if there's a difference between international law and Canadian constitutional law, which prevails? That those were difficult from, you know, at risk was, at issue was the state nature of our, our country, the state of Canada that he, and its present makeup. Uh, that gets pretty serious in terms of how you, you handle it. So it was the most challenging in that respect. Um, and because we were criticized on both sides, it was a signal that we probably got it right in terms of our response, or close to being right. Nothing is perfect, but but it was close to, and, and there, were, there was a lot of favorable comment as well as a fair amount of criticism. But it, um, the other case that gave me great anguish, a great anguish, was the Rodriguez case on um, assisted suicide. And um, that was um, uh, difficult. Uh, uh, the case was decided 5-4 against Sue Rodriguez. Um, who wanted to, in her words, die when she had Lou Gehrig's disease and wanted to die when she no longer could have a good relationship with her son, who was young. Uh, and uh, uh, the pro criminal code provided a prohibition, as the most criminal codes of countries throughout the world, against assisted suicide. Um, I went with the majority. I, I was uh, very much troubled by the decision. And one of the uh, issues of my concern uh, was that th this was best decided by parliament rather than the court. But you can't just say, I, I don't want to decide this because the case is there before you. But in my view, uh, that kind of question um, puts the nine human beings around the table. We have a circular table in the conference room of the court um, in, a, in a very difficult <clears throat> position uh, because a, a, a question like that involves all sorts of disciplines. It, you know, the, the word is polycentric. It's got many uh, focuses uh, of in, information your uh, question of medical science, uh, your, your faith, uh, your, your uh, philosophy, uh, 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 equality rights, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, issues, issues come to the floor, come to the floor. And, and I, I had great difficulty with it. And I, part of the difficulty was that I thought I never met Sue Rodriguez, but she was not a person that was seeking attention. She was genuine, as far as I could tell. And I heard from someone later, many years later, that that was the case. She was genuine and she seemed that way. And uh, that added to the, if you like, the discomfort I had in making that, that call. It seemed like a difficult one. Uh, th there's one question that we had, who was the greatest inspiration in your life? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd have to say that I owe more people a debt of gratitude, I think, than anyone else uh, in the world. I, uh, 
I've been the beneficiary of um, so many mentors, um, so many supporters, and I don't mean this in a uh, political sense or in a uh, sort of egotistical sense. Um, I've also got, a, I'm sure, a share of critics, but but I I I, I couldn't reduce that to one to, to one person. I've had inspirations of of judges. I, I've had inspiration of um, great masters. Um, I, I just finished not too long ago uh, um, the, the, the book on Da Vinci um, and just marvel at the genius of the man. Um, my favorite judge is probably Louis Brandeis, a, a, a Jewish emigre uh, from Austria. Um, brilliant, brilliant judge who took on giants in, in terms of the establishment and so on. Not because he was a anti side of, you know, anti this and anti that. It just, he thought there was an injustice and, and so on. Um, so in all different walks of life, I've, I've had, um, I had, an, I grew up with a man named John Ferguson who played with the Montreal Canadiens in hockey from Vancouver, we played soccer um, against each other uh, as youngsters, as 10, 11, 12 year olds. And he, when he played for the Canadians, I, we went for, it, it, when he played at the Leafs, he, we got together for a beer after the game. And one of the people that came along was Jean Beliveau. And I just couldn't get over the man and read about him and, uh, uh, in the books. And, uh, he, he became an inspiration looking back and Lou Gehrig himself, because <clears throat> it was the first book I ever read was Pride of the Yankees. So, I mean, there've been so many, I can't reduce it to one person. We have one question that people have been asking me in Windsor and they said, how many degrees does his honor actually have, honorary degrees? And I said, well, that's a good question. Well, we'll ask him when, when, he, comes, <laughs> uh, when he comes into town or when we see him virtually. So with the assumption LLD, how many do you have total? I, 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 I get mixed up, I get mixed up. <laughs> I, it's either 19 or 20, I'm not sure. But let me say this, let me say this. Uh, every one of them, the, I, I, my story is every one of them is the best honorary degree I have. So assumption is the best honorary degree I've had. OK, why do I say that? Because when you ask an athlete and this was asked of a Yankee fan, a Yankee player some years ago, this is your fifth World Series championship. Which one is your best? And he replied, all five are my best. All of mine are my best. This is a post-secondary institution. They deal in transforming young people's lives, those institutions. Education explains why you're here, why the bishop is here, and why I'm here, and why many on the, on the, on, on the call are. Yeah, it, it, nothing is like it. Right. If we want to break barriers down, it's not the guarantee. Nothing is the guarantee about barriers, hu human barriers. But a, a better way has not been found than education. Absolutely. Well, Your Honor, I, it's a pleasure to, to speak with you and to have you this evening. We are all uh, learned much about uh, your life and, and drew inspiration from it. Um, and of course, we're very proud to have you, as I mentioned, as, a, as an alumnus of Assumption University. And I'm, I'm sure uh, you're proud of that as well. Um, at this point, I'd like to call upon our uh, Bishop, and Chancellor, um, Bishop Ronald Peter Fabro, uh, to give the closing remarks. He gets the last word. <laughs> Thank you, John. I don't know if I'll actually get the last word though. <laughs> I want to uh, express my uh, deep thanks to uh, Dr. Yakabuchi for his uh, presentation uh, to us this evening. Uh, I was really inspired by it. Had, uh, just a couple of points that uh, struck me. 
uh, in, in this very distinguished career uh, that he has had, uh, he, he talked about the uh, important influences uh, on his life and he highlighted his own parents, uh, his family, uh, the Italian background, uh, the friends he grew up with, uh, that these influence really shaped him as a person. Uh, that to me was very significant. A second point I'd like to make is uh, a point he, he just passed over very briefly at the end of his talk uh, was his appreciation for spe the specializing in indigenous issues. Um, uh, that he saw it, he said that it was the most important issue uh, for us in Canada at this point. Uh, and I think uh, when I looked at his CV, uh, some of the uh, 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 works that he was involved in, some of the, the uh, more important works that he was involved in his appointment by the government of Canada, uh, to represent uh, as a, its representative of the government to lead discussions uh, towards a resolution of the legacy of Indian residential schools. Um, that was uh, significant. Uh, part of your, uh, your, your legacy, uh, Frank. Uh, and then in be, being imported, uh, appointed six years later by the Ontario government to review the process for including uh, Indigenous people on the Ontario jury rules, uh, be following criticisms uh, that they were underrepresentative. Um, I think your report was a call uh, to all of us uh, in Ontario and in, in Canada uh, to the broader systemic issues at heart um, in, in what was then and continues to be a dysfunctional relationship between the judiciary system and indigenous people. Um, I know the uh, bishop, all of us in Canada, the bishops of Canada, uh, it's a focus for us right now. And uh, the con I'd like to say that the contributions you have made uh, in your career uh, are very significant. Uh, I think in, in highlighting uh, what is dysfunctional and the root causes, uh, I think you've made an important contribution to the journey uh, that we all need to continue now uh, of justice, uh, healing and reconciliation. And so I thank you particularly for that. Uh, and uh, my last point is uh, uh, your encouragement to us, I think at Assumption University, <laughs> the best honorary degree that you've received, that's, that's encouragement, but uh, your whole, whole life story was uh, I think uh, uh, an indication how at what we do at the university uh, is uh, can be transformative, can change people's lives uh, just by doing every day what uh, the search for truth, the intellectual life. Uh, we're we're so blessed at Assumption with uh, Principal uh, Dr. Capucci. Uh, uh, we're so blessed in so many ways. Our diocese in the, the influence that Assumption has had over, uh, 150, over 150 years. It's changed the life of individuals. People talk to me uh, of uh, how their lives were changed at Assumption. And I think uh, your reflection on your, 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 your personal life and the things that influenced you is a real encouragement to us. So um, a big thank you to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Yakabuchi and uh, my sincere congratulations on this honorary degree. Thank you very, very much, Bishop. May I just, if, 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 if you'll permit me, uh, uh, John, John sent me your statement uh, on, that you issued on Indigenous matters and I uh, was quite moved by it. I thought I was very impressed by it. I sent a copy, I gave a copy to my next door neighbor who's been interested in the issues as a, as a concerned Catholic for uh, indigenous issues. It's a brilliant statement. Congratulations for that and your leadership with your fellow bishops of Canada recently in their statement and their actions. Uh, I, I, I'm very, very, very impressed by what's going on. So thank you, if I may say so.
Thank you. You're, uh, Bishop Fabra, you're right. And I, I'm getting used to saying that phrase that you're right. Actually, I, I was the one that got to say the last words and, and their words of thanks for everyone who made this evening a possibility. At the top of our, our list, I'd like to thank uh, the Honorable Dr. Frank Iacobucci uh, throughout his career. Uh, you know, your honor, you've reflected the tenets of, of Assumption University, goodness, discipline and knowledge. And congratulations again on tonight on a very well-deserved uh, LLD. Uh, I thank our bishop, uh, Bishop Fabro, who is our bishop and our chancellor for presiding over this special convocation ceremony. We're very fortunate at Assumption to have such a dedicated bishop and chancellor and also a champion of, of Assumption's work. And of course, I, I like to thank the support we receive from our board of governors uh, and along with our, our team at Assumption, Cecile Bertrand, Moira Belmore, Jessica Lemon, and of course, the team at the diocese, Mrs. Uh, Marilyn Hassel, for, for helping to organize uh, the scheduling as well. And, and last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank all our guests for joining us this evening and encourage you to visit Assumption University's website, Facebook page, and Twitter feed to see about the upcoming exciting events we have. Um, with his honor's permission, we're going to uh, uh, put this video on our YouTube channel. So if you have individuals that like to, uh, to view it at a later date, they're more than welcome to do so. So at this point, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining us this evening and uh, wish everyone a pleasant evening and, uh, and all the best. So thank you and have a good evening.